Hello, my dear friends. How is it going? I'm Ari Thurger, and today I take the opportunity to answer some of my patrons' questions concerning the authenticity of the Kensington Rune Stone, which is a stone on which runes were carved. And it was discovered in Minnesota, United States of America, in the late 19th century, to be more precise, in 1898. Uh, by all accounts, it is an archaeological fraud, a hoax. Uh, there are many reasons why several archaeological forgeries are made. Uh, for instance, uh, before the 1950s, uh, which was when archaeology finally became a science, but before then, archaeology was done by amateurs, complete amateurs, mostly members of the high social classes, nobility mostly. It became the hobby of the rich, and uh, it was a prestigious activity, especially in the 19th century. And many forgeries were made so that these elite bosses could have even more prestige and rise their social status among the scientific community. And this coincides with a period of great political tension in the West and the rise of nationalism, especially in Europe. As such, many forgeries were also made to basically gatekeep a specific culture, which was the chosen culture to be the background of a specific modern country. Uh, living in political fantasies of a nationalist character gave rise to thousands of archaeological forgeries, uh, some of which really well done. <laughs> but, of course, with technological evolution, uh, archaeology finally becoming a science with its own methods, and uh, new ways of dating materials and contexts, many artifacts ended up being considered forgeries, finally. And as some of these forgeries have become so deeply ingrained on the history and identity of a particular country, they have miraculously disappeared, or were stolen, or lost, or destroyed in an accident, never to be seen again to avoid the forgeries being detected and completely put to question several historical identity and societal aspects of a given country. Uh, for those of you who don't know yet, uh, I'm an archaeologist and uh, as of this video I have nigh a decade of experience on the field, but also concerning forgeries. Back in 2018, uh, I have taken another course which was uh, focused on the restoration of archaeological materials and objects, which has led me to have important knowledge concerning materials, uh, such as clay, glass, metals, and so on and so forth, and also um, knowledge on, on the methods and materials that have been used to make these artifacts according to the society and the technology of the period. This helps to detect forgeries. However, the person that has taught me all of this, he himself had been a forger, a counterfeiter, right? And uh, for many years working on an antique shop, making forgeries of archaeological objects, selling them for <laughs> extraordinary absurd prices for those who do not have um, detailed knowledge about these matters. In fact, he was so good at doing this that most experts cannot detect that they are fakes, right? And this type of work, how, how to use materials, the knowledge behind the cultures, the manufacturing methods of a certain object, etc., was what also gave him a vast knowledge to be able to restore true archaeological objects. There are people who are very good at this type of work. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. And despite being a web of lies, I'll give them that. Um, it's an art, and these people are phenomenal artists with a, a great knowledge of not only history, but of the archaeological contexts, the materials, and are also able to reconstruct, to a certain extent, the ancient methods that were used to make these materials. To the point that they are exactly the same as the real thing. The only difference is that they were made now. <laughs> I have had in my hands forgeries so well made, I would say it was the real thing. Because it's, it's not just the objects themselves, but it is possible to make them look old, broken, even the metal corrosion can look as if the material 
was indeed exposed to a particular environment for centuries. However, when it comes to stone, you cannot date stone, which makes the stone forgeries harder to determine their authenticity. As you know, carbon dating is a method of determining the age of an object that contains material that was once alive, uh, or contains material which in its composition has carbon. So measuring the amount of carbon-14, uh, we get a pretty good idea of its age. However, this is not applicable to stones, as they do not contain carbon-14. Uh, most of the time we know about the age of a particular stone monument based on a um, combination of factors, including historical, uh, historical records, um, archaeology and anthropological and linguistic studies, and other materials and objects as associated to them to these contexts, which we know to be of a certain period. Even the method of cutting on stone and uh, the human expression of some artistic form can give us a pretty good idea. Even though you cannot date stone, you can date the earth, the soil, and as time passes, layers and layers of soil, the strata, uh, and dust and other materials will accumulate over time. And when you dig a stone monument, you can date the soil, you can have a, a pretty good idea of the layers and uh, how much time has passed since that monument was covered, as well as dating the soil in which the monument stands. Also, there's lichenometry, using lichen growth to determine the age of exposed rock, which helps to determine the period in which a particular stone was exposed before succumbing and being buried by the sense of time. <laughs> so anything carved on rock, on that, on the rock, on the or rock surface, we can have an idea when was the last time this rock was exposed. And lichen on top of a carving on rock also helps to determine the period when the lichen started to grow. Therefore, the carving is prior to that particular lichen growth. Of course, there's there's been several cases of fake stone artifacts deposited, deposited deep in the earth, literally you dig and put them there, covered by soil and then dug up to make it look like it was indeed down in the earth. However, the soil is obviously adulterated, changed, there's a clear layer change and the context is contaminated. So, I thought you should know these things in case you might not be aware so that it can help to have a better perception of one of the things we have to deal with in archaeology, which, which is quite problematic and complex. Well, moving on to the subject, the Kensington Stone United States consists of a block with runic inscriptions discovered in 1898 in the rural area of Solomon Douglas, state of Minnesota, on the property of a Swedish immigrant, Olaf Hemann. Supposedly, the block had been found under the roots of a tree on, on this property of this man's property, Hemann, right? Uh, the inscription alludes to Scandinavian explorers who would have landed in 1362 on the east coast of what would much later become the United States. At the time, a copy of the inscriptions was sent to Professor Olaus Breda, University of Minnesota, who soon published a study in 1910 claiming that it was a forgery. And just to make it clear, to this day, every Scandinavian runologist and expert in Scandinavian historical linguistics has declared the Kensington Stone to be a hoax. Well, Brida also sent a copy to several European experts, Olaf uh, Rik, Sophos Uya, uh, Gustav uh, Storm, Magnus Olsen and Adolf Nurin, to name a few, all agreeing with his position that it really is a forgery. Since then, a long struggle began between several North American individuals of all sorts in different uh, scientific backgrounds, some defending the authenticity of the object, but the vast majority of the vast, vast majority maintaining a skeptical position to this day. Recently, it was discovered handwritten notes of a tailor, Edward Larson, uh, who resided in Alexandria, Minnesota, dating from 1883. 
they contain two types of food targ, the, the form of the runic alphabet, one of them with adaptations for modern Swedish and with much resemblance to the type of non-standard runes found in the Kensington inscription. One of the most recent epigraphic and historical studies of the object of this stone was published in 2019, quite recently, with the following results. The people who are suspected of being involved in the Kensington inscription are Olaf Hemann, Sven Fögelot, and Anders Andersson. It is Anderson's son's Swedish dialect that matches the linguistic features of the inscription. He was born in 1863 in the parish of Linsel in um, Herjaldalen, Sweden, and immigrated in 1882 with his mother and sister to Minnesota, where he later married a cousin of Olaf Hummans' wife, uh, uh, settling on, on a farm very close to Hummans, uh, the place where yeah, Hemans, Hemans, sorry, um, and the place where the inscription was found, right? It seems likely that he was the main author of the inscription, although there are also some indications that, that his friend, Olaf Hemann, played an important role in the manufacture of the runestone, of this forgery. <laughs> well, uh, we have to take into account that this was a period of great immigration of Scandinavians to the United States seeking a new life, better conditions, fleeing poverty and hunger, but also in a completely different context. It was a search for their identities in a new country, trying to cling on to something that would give them some capacity for better ad adaptation by clinging on to a position, uh, to a, sorry, to a, a possible historical past. This is a time when, of course, there began to be a great deal of North American interest in the Vikings as early as the 1830s. And many Scandinavians in America, based on the Icelandic sagas, tried to see Vinland, the place where the Norse would have landed in America, indeed, but now as somewhere in New England, in the northeastern United States, uh, which we, know, we now know uh, Vinland wasn't there at all. Um, therefore, from this idea, there followed several publications by North Americans and many Swedish immigrants residing in the USA as well, trying to find evidences of ancient Nordic incursions before Columbus in the Americas. There were even quite a few inscriptions that were said to be from the medieval Norse, but of course turned out to be engravings from the indigenous natives. Of course, um, in the last two decades of the 1800s, there is a great increase in political and cultural idealization and the uses of the Nordic presence and identity, and this has created a modern American culture focused on the Norse and a Nordic past in the Americas. It is precisely in this context that the Kensington forgery is inserted at a time when the Vikings are extremely valued and there is little credible information about Scandinavian incursions, taking into account that the Icelandic sagas are literary narratives and not historical chronicles. Therefore, it was created an absolute credibility in an idealized past that never actually existed, in this case appealing to the creation of hoaxes, falsifications of all sorts to really push the narrative of an ideal Scandinavian past in the history of the United States, further giving credit to the ideas of the time concerning the Native Americans as to be of inferior race and that European descendants have the right to that land because Europeans had been there in an early age. With that finding of ancient inscriptions in the Kensington Stone, in the United States, without a doubt, it was a great event at the time, extremely publicized by newspapers and magazines of the period. Mysterious symbols of a European background, which evoked an alternative past and allegedly superior to the native one, with this, with this type of sentiment at the time, right? It was then hailed as the ultimate proof of a Viking past in the United States. Of course, 
Uh, I don't think that the Kensington Stone is just or solely a Eurocentric and racist product, which certainly had these proportions and feelings in the American society of the time. Of course, it has had, unfortunately. But originally, maybe, we are also facing a type of folklore rooted in North American Scandinavian communities that were proud of their historical heritage. And then there was an attempt to bring or to make a piece of home to reinforce the identity in a new place and a new life of adaptation. And this adaptation can be less abrupt with the help of elements of folklore. And of course, the uh, Kensington Stone eventually became a symbol of ethnic pride in the long run. Well, the stone is currently on display in a museum located in the city of Alexandria, Minnesota, uh, attracting thousands of tourists to the place every year. Um, and also a demonstration between the idealization of uh, a, a fake past and local commercial interests. In this way, we perceive an effort by the local community to build a fake history that adapts to its socio-economic purposes and ethnic self-awareness in a new land. So, um, I do hope this video was useful and stay sharp. I I'll leave you with this little message, if you don't mind. I don't think it to be wise to immediately judge people by their actions. There's always a reason why people do the things they do, and it can go wrong, very wrong, of course, even when people have the best of intentions. But things are never truly black and white. Someone's whole life, decisions, actions, beliefs, traumas, can determine the course of a single action. And what may se seem to us uh, something rather simple and even shallow, it often has a long history behind it, with many paths taken, which are hard to truly understand unless we have also lived them or walk on them. So, thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thanks for today. Until we meet again, my dear friends.